Mary, I appreciate you so much. So how about, how's that? Uh, I'll start over again. So this is our <clears throat> uh, one year anniversary of Ghosts of Bacon. And my sister Penny just gave me a shout out for happy anniversary. I appreciate that, Pen. Um, now that I pushed the magic on air button, um, you should be able to hear me just fine. <laughs> so what I want to say, gang, is uh, thanks uh, for, you know, all of the support. I see all of the uh, familiar faces here in the chat. Um, like I said, you know, one year straight, uh, I've been doing this. Uh, we have, this is our 50th episode. Uh, pretty proud of that. <clears throat> and tonight, uh, what I had for you is, is something in um, Baconian uh, history that uh, is actually a, a pretty famous little tidbit. And if you hadn't heard of honorific abilitude and detatibus before, uh, it's it's one of those things that appears only once in the works of Shakespeare. I'll be going into my little dog and pony show here in a minute. Um, longest word in the English language that uh, alternates consonants and vowels. And a lot has been said about it over the years in terms of whether or not it's evidence that Sir Francis Bacon wrote the works of Shakespeare. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it, gang. Um, all right, so here we go. Just wanted to make sure people could hear me now, that's all. So I think <clears throat> that will work here for our presentation. Thanks, Penn. Appreciate you very much. Appreciate the support. So honorific abilitude and uh First of all, I want to get into the actual meaning of it. As I show the slideshow here. Um, it does have a bit of it, like I said at the beginning of uh, the show, a little bit of a history here. Uh, the meaning of it is the state of being able to receive honors. And so... Uh, it's hard to believe that this word really didn't stick with us <laughs> since it's so easy uh, to say. Like I said, 27 letters long, and it's also the longest word alternating consonants and vowels, as I said earlier. Here you can actually see it uh, from the uh, facsimile, uh, the first folio. It's right here. And it's actually from uh, one of the clowns in Love's Labor's Lost. So a lot has been also said about that particular uh, play because each... Uh, <clears throat> the title uh, begins with uh, L, and in uh, simple cipher, L is 11, so uh, the initials total 33, which <clears throat> people have pointed out as evidence that Bacon wrote. So in the past, what people have done is they've used this word to create anagrams, uh, things that just claim that Francis Bacon wrote Shakespeare. Other people said, well, no, it was Ben Johnson, and, and they, they make it say what they wanted to say. Um, other people had, had created anagrams that said that William Shakespeare wrote it and that they should all shut up. So um, Hull Platt is a guy who um, said it first, and he came up with this Latin uh, anagram that means these plays, Bacon's offsprings, are preserved for the world. And that was, you know, soundly debunked. The problem is, is that um, when you try to come up with an anagram with a word with this many letters, um, what happens is... It, there are far too many possibilities. So therefore, um, it's very difficult to say that this is the definitive answer uh, because it, it could turn into so many random things. So when we look at anagrams, in particular in the work that I do, you know that I um, uh, often use anagrams, uh, but they're always specific to the context. And they're also very short because the letters are very limited in what they could possibly be. So... <clears throat> Um, okay. If you must, cat. Honorific abilitude and attainibus. I hope I hope that was every bit as satisfying as everyone hoped. Um, you know, and I, I lost my call in number, gang. I, I really apologize because I planned on having the first person who could call in and and pronounce it. Uh, I, I was going to give you a free copy, a signed copy of my book, my latest book, but unfortunately, the call in number doesn't even work, so I'm not going to throw that out there. Anyway, uh, here's the effect it's had on uh, Baconianism, the idea that Sir Francis Bacon has written Shakespeare. Um, unfortunately, just like the work of uh, Dr. Orville Orwin, a few shows back, uh, John Edwards and I got on here, and we talked about how his, uh, Orville Orwin and his cipher wheel. 
and how we felt that he was actually a part of a disinformation campaign. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the effect that that has had on the authorship question that Bacon wrote the works of Shakespeare, it, it has really set everyone back. And, and unfortunately, this word has as well, because there are so many possibilities. Um, and the problem is, is this, this sense of overzealousness of, you know, many of us are obviously certain that Bacon wrote Shakespeare, myself, obviously, one of them since I read his messages that stating that fact. However, um, if people are just grasping on one little signpost in, in, a, in a play, for, ex for an instance, like uh, the L's in Love's Labor's Lost, totaling 33 in Civil Cipher and saying, oh, that means he wrote it. Eh, that's being overzealous. And we're, we're appealing to our own confirmation bias and seeing what we want to see. And that's what's happened with uh, honorific ability. Honorific abilitude and a Um, So if there's one solution, you know, actually confirming something, well, now that's something a little more definitive. And that's, that's kind of what I'm, I'm about. Um, otherwise, you know, you just kind of have to have to be uh, people dismiss anything you put out there. And so that is not constructive either. So because of the fact that so many anagrams could be formed, especially since you have consonant, vowel, consonant, that is very easy to construct multiple words and, and, and phrases. So uh, there, there's no way to actually use that as evidence. So once again, I, I, I go back to the standards of context and logic. So um, because of the ciphertext and the messages of the plaque adorning Shakespeare's funerary monument in Holy Trinity Church in Stratford-upon-Avon, this plaque we see here depicted uh, that I decrypted, the text within that message states, specifically that Bacon wrote Shakespeare. So he says, I used the name Shakespeare in at least three different ways. He makes a statement, uh, which I put in my first book, uh, The Holy Trinity Decryption. Now, because I have continued to make all of these discoveries using the Baconian ciphers, um, it always goes back to the key pieces of context, of logic, of making sure you're following a standard operating procedure, not varying from it, not trying to massage the evidence that you find. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if we just find one example in the first folio, that's not enough. However, uh, when I applied this same rule to this word, uh, I did get some interesting results. If we take the cipher systems of Sir Fran known that were known to be used by Sir Francis Bacon. Um, if anyone who wants to play along with me here, you can uh, go to my website, theghostsofbacon.com, and click on the resources tab. And if you scroll down, you'll see this uh, this page up here, Cipher Resources. And you can actually open up um, simple reverse and K ciphers and short cipher and uh, actually do these same calculations as I'm going through them. Uh, you can just check my work if you don't mind. So... Like I said, uh, simple, reverse, K, and short. Um, I haven't done a lot of work with short cipher on this podcast um, because when I first found that, you know, it was one of the uh, cipher systems that the Ros Rosie Cross used, I, I felt that it was kind of limited in, in terms of what it could be used for. I have since discovered that I couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, this was very, very helpful and, and a big part of what they did because when you use all four of these ciphers and they all click into place and all say the same message, you know it was intentional. And so instead of just three, which I thought was pretty phenomenal, which it is, um, when you have four, all four telling you the same thing, that's pretty impressive evidence. So what I did was I took all four of these cipher systems and I calculated the values of the word. Uh, each letter has a value in a different value in each of these systems. And <clears throat> I just added them up. So if we look at this in the context of Bacon's true identity as revealed within the ciphertext of the plaque, answers do appear. And so it does actually communicate. The answer is yes. So there's a close up of that page for those of you who are going to go there and kind of play along with my little silly reindeer games here. And <clears throat> And here you can see simple reverse and K is the first link. And then uh, Elizabethan short cipher is the fourth link down. So if you want to click on those, you'll be able to do so. So if we look at the simple cipher value of honorific ability to and uh, I would ob 
I'll, I'll give you a moment. If let's see, is uh, let me look at the chat for a second. Anyone going to take me up on this? Good evening, Teresa. I'm glad you joined us. Thanks, man. I appreciate that very much. Um, you know, uh, people who read the headlines, yeah, they they look at, uh, they see the cipher signposts, and, I, and and that's what I call them. I call them signposts, um, where it's like it's kind of like waving a flag, saying, "Hey, look here. If you look closely, there's a message here." Um, people mistake the signposts for the message, and um, and that's how it's been used up to this point because people are afraid to actually go into de actual decryptions because of the experience of, um, well, the people who followed the path of uh, Dr. Uh, Owens, so. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, we try to do our due diligence. And and the thing is, what um, people don't know is that um, people are actually, we're, we're kind of growing our ranks here. People have been kind of joining us here behind the scenes and messaged me saying, hey, I want to jump in on this. Uh, what should I take a look at next? And uh, that's really exciting for me. And, and all you, <clears throat> as all of you know, uh, I'm, I made this podcast to make everything that I do completely open source so every, anyone can do what I do. And um, it, the more people we have corroborating our evidence, the better we are, for sure. Thanks for that. Okay, so let me get back at it. If we use simple cipher and add the values of each of these letters in simple cipher with the, the letter a having the value of one and z24 um, you add them all up here with each of their values and we end up with a total of 287 in simple cipher and again this is the way these cipher systems work they usually point to a value and in this case it's a value in k cipher of the fraternity of the rosy cross fra rosy cross so for me, that was a, a, a big signpost saying, hey, yo, here we are. Um, you might want to see what else is here. So um, again, it, it's nothing definitive in and of itself, but it is a signpost saying, look closer. So if we take a look at the reverse cipher, um, you'll notice that uh, it's a, it totals 388, which I don't have a known uh, corollary for that. Uh, there is um, a... How do I say this? Um, a possibility that uh, I'm not going to share at this point. Uh, but if we use the trick of the prime factorization, this is something that uh, Bacon and company used, uh, prime numbers in particular, as well as uh, the factorization of these primes. Uh, 388 is four times the 25th prime number, which is 97. 97 isn't a known corollary either. However, it's the 25th prime number. So four times 25 is 100, which is Francis Bacon in simple cipher. Now I, I've seen this. Um, I mean, if you think I'm reaching, it is a pretty marvelous coincidence, just the same. Um, and the if we, see, if we use the number three as C, and then it says C and the number 88, that's what I was alluding to earlier. This is something that's going to appear in my next book that uh, I'm not going to be discussing this evening. But these and of, of themselves made me keep on going. If we look at our K cipher sum, uh, this is 600 and, uh, 677. So if we look at 67 as Francis in simple, if we look at the seven as the letter G in simple, and we know that G is 33 in K cipher, meaning bacon in simple, uh, it could actually uh, be Francis Bacon. 67, seven, or likewise, we could have six is the letter F in simple and 77 is Rex Bacon in simple. So it just so happens the real answer here is 677. Once again, it's the 123rd prime number, which is Rex Bacon again in reverse cipher. So um, I would say the hits just keep on coming. All three, we have values that make sense in terms of the context of Francis Bacon. Um, if we look at the conclusions, um, and as I was putting this together, unfortunately, I didn't have time to do uh, the short cipher, but those of you who are out there and want to uh, earn some extra credit, I, I suggest you do it. It's really pretty cool. So what conclusions can we draw? 
Well, uh, this is just one example of a signpost appearing in Love's Labor's Lost, one of the book, one of the uh, plays attributed to the actor William Shakespeare. Um, so I see this as a signpost of the Rosy Cross, especially when the very first value right out of right off the bat, right out of the gates, is uh, Fra Rosy Cross, uh, 287. So because the previous decryptions that I've done, and I, I, I see these patterns and how they, they continue to appear, um, what I've discovered is that the true skeleton key here in understanding uh, all of these messages of the Fraternity of the Rosy Cross is indeed that plaque. Uh, my initial decryption laid out all of the secrets, all of the keys in order to understand uh, what we're looking at here. Um, so what keeps appearing are the signatures of Francis Bacon's hidden identity and his hidden uh, family relationships. Now, these are valuable keys in any research anyone else is going to do. Once we recognize that um, and admit to ourselves, that's the big thing, and that Francis Bacon really was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots and Francis II, everything unfolds it, and it continues to do so in um, <clears throat> uh, multiple ways. In fact, in my next book, it actually unlocked a whole series of cipher messages in Shakespeare's sonnets. And so uh, I devote an entire chapter just to that information. Uh, if I was going to, and I'm going to, do my due diligence when it comes to this uh, topic and the cipher and the sonnets, it's going to take another entire book. So I'm already looking forward to uh, sharing all that with you as well. And so my next book is called The Keys of the Rosy Cross, The Ghosts of Bacon. And so I wanted to offer uh, honorific ability and Tatibus to you as just one of those little signposts that help us to unlock the keys of the Rosy Cross. So I think that um, we'll open it up to questions here. So what do we got, gang? Amy, that's exactly it. Um, and so, and not only is is the writer educated, um, the, the signposts, and, and again, I'm just I'm just applying the the cipher systems that they were known to use in this group uh, to this one word that the word itself, because it is special, you know, is just waving a big flag saying, "Hey, check me out." And so that that's how these ciphers, particularly in the sonnets as well the way they work. There's usually something very uh, specific or peculiar about them that draws your attention, whether it's a misspelling or a strange capitalization, those kinds of things that help you to apply these uh, ciphers to those individual words. You look for the meanings of those numbers that appear, and then you apply those meanings to the context of the rest of the words, and you get a message. It's really pretty cool. Um, Oh, Jen, what a great, great question. Um, I believe the answer is that, yes, he knew. Um, in fact, he, I, he knew from a very early age. And I, I think that um, I suspect he knew before his, his teen years. And he, when he was 15, um, the, the ciphertext of the, of the plaque state, uh, and it's in my first book, he says, when I was 15, I stir them up, I bad leader. So what he did was um, his friends and, and, and family, uh, extended family, uh, he kind of went around saying, hey, I'm supposed to be king. And um, it got him in trouble because soon after that, as soon as he turned 16, he was sent to France uh, with Amias Paulette, the ambassador to France. And I believe that Elizabeth's idea was, I'll let your uncle Henry feel, uh, deal with you. And um, when he arrived at the royal court of, of Henry, King Henry of France, he was given the royal treatment. Uh, he, he toured Europe the same way that any young prince would. Uh, he traveled in state, uh, and learning uh, painting, learning writing, learning uh, every language under the sun, and, and even you know beyond what he already knew. So um, I would say he knew uh, well before he was 15, but at least by the time he was 15, because that's when the message says that he decided to go around telling everybody, hey, I'm supposed to be king.
Oh, Guitarist. Yeah, great. Um, I wasn't going to bring that up, but that's a really great point. The Northumberland manuscript, uh, that gang, that's that's a, a topic of a couple of shows in and of itself. Um, clearly has a version of this exact word. And for Baconians, yeah, they usually say, see, it, it, it's in this book and it's in, in this manuscript. Um, and, you know, I... I understand where they're coming from, but it's kind of like what I was talking about uh, during the uh, podcast. You know, people seeing that as confirmation bias, that word was used in a variety of different places. Okay. And so just because it appears also in a manuscript, uh, the Northumberland manuscript in particular, does not mean there's a direct correlation. It means that both writers use the word. And so, but yeah, what a great point. So scrolling through. Let's see. Um, can I ask a maybe dumb question? I doubt it's dumb if it's coming from you, Kat. Why did you first think of Bacon as S? Did you just learn the ciphers and makes the connection? And then did that lead you to the Mary Francis connection? Um, no. Um, what made me first think of Bacon as Shakespeare is, is all of the evidence, all of the uh, circumstantial evidence that Baconians have always used. Uh, it's very, very convincing in and of itself. Um, so that led me to think of it as a possibility. Uh, what then happened was um, <clears throat> uh, my friends, uh, uh, Chris Dona and Chris Morford were studying that very same plaque. And um, uh, Christopher Morford found what became his, his very famous uh, Morford Bacon Triangle. Uh, and it's very similar and works in the same way as Peter Amundsen's uh, uh, Bacon uh, pentagram. And so because of these things, his name appearing in a steganographic manner, and I ha always had an interest in cipher systems, in my mind, those were signposts that said that Bacon probably was behind the creation of at least the plaque. And so when I started applying some of my uh, decryption skills to the plaque and basically decrypted it and, and found all of these messages where he states explicitly that he was, um, uh, that he used the name Shakespeare. And he also states explicitly multiple times in multiple ways that his mother was Mary Queen of Scots in France and he was, his father was Francis II. So that's what made me make that connection. Such a great question, Kat. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, Z. Yep. Just like uh, Gatawa said, yep. So, AO, um, seems Francis was setting a stage for future generations to question everything we have been thought, taught and to rise up or rebel against the established authorities who are not worthy of their power. Well, you know what? Um, that theme is definitely there and it's there within um, the new Atlantis of, of, of self-governing and, and, and enlightened uh, people. Um, it, it's also uh, is the theme of, in terms of how he wanted to revamp education uh, for all people. And um, yeah, anyway, it's, it's all in his books uh, in particular in uh, Novus Organum, Novum Organum, excuse me. Yeah, Jan, he, he sent away from being naughty, but he got the royal treatment. Um, Gitao, same here. Oh, I lost you. Um, you know, the work of Peter um, uh, Peter Amundsen and uh, uh, Peter Dawkins in particular, um, I've been following these guys for a very long time. And, uh, and I read uh, Amundsen's uh, Seven Steps to Mercy. Uh, which I found fascinating. And and um, when I saw some of the techniques he was using <clears throat> in his decryptions, um, I decided to start taking a crack at it myself. And that's when I fell in with uh, Chris Morford through Chris Dona. Same story. <laughs> well, now, isn't that a great question, Mary? Why would Bacon pick an author who couldn't read and write to make famous? rather than someone who was literate. <clears throat> well, you have to understand uh, the thought at the time. Uh, men in, in Bacon's uh, station 
uh, they would take on masks when they would write anything of a literary sort because um, writing meant that they weren't fit for public office. And so picking someone like uh, William Shakespeare, that was his name, um, and changing it into Shakespeare is something, you know, that Bacon would not have been able to uh, resist in the sense of uh, the symbolism of it. <clears throat> and um, so, yeah, I, uh, William Shakespeare was was the perfect guy. And then years later, when uh, all of these plays appear with his name on it, he would say, well, wait a minute, this guy could barely sign his name. You know, how is this possible? And it leads people to kind of, you know, beg credibility there. It leads them to the truth. That's that's my opinion on that anyway. Let's see what you got here, Ray. I'm having trouble seeing this. Just noticing letter the letters that have the letter I before and after it. F L N. Each six letter in between, just an observation. Wow. Interesting. Interesting thought, interesting observation, right? Yeah, I mean, again, gang, um, that is something that does happen, uh, in particular in, in the sonnets. I, I notice with the way words are juxtapositioned, and then you add their values together uh, in a phrase, and it, it creates uh, messages as well. Something to look at, Ray, for sure. I, I say dig in, <laughs> please. Um Yeah, guitarist. Uh, again, I think that was a big part of it as well, my friend. Um, somebody who was in the theater industry, and and it, the name worked for a symbolism for sure. And yeah, Amy, once again, you know, spot on. Uh, the Rosie Cross was definitely successful in in revamping how education worked here in the New World. <laughs> Thanks, guitarist. Um, You know, <laughs> thanks, Ao. So, listen, gang. You know, I, this was a, 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 sh a short but sweet one. Um, what I want to do, you know, moving ahead, we're going to be looking at lots of different things uh, throughout the summer here. Um, I am, and I, I keep saying this, you know, putting on the finishing touches of my book. However, uh, every time I do it, I go through and I start editing. Um, something else pops up, and I make a new discovery, and it, it's it's the phrase or idea of a rabbit hole doesn't do it justice. Uh, this is something that just uh, continues and extends and it, it doesn't end. And um, I know that, you know, my friends who have been like looking at this, looking into this with me and making the discoveries of their own that are just as exciting, uh, just as astounding. I can't wait to have, um, uh, you know, uh, Will Russell and, and, and uh, John Edwards on so that they can share some of their latest findings. Cause it's, it, they're not really, they're only feed me little tidbits just to keep me teased, but it's going to be jaw dropping stuff. They can't, they basically want to reveal it live on, on air so that I, you know, have that look on my face of, you know, they, they apparently love doing that to me. Same thing. Uh, Jason Mercer just uh, dropped something, a bomb on our private, um, our little private group that where we share all of our information with each other. And um, Jason, I, I can't wait to have you uh, come on and <laughs> blow some more minds. Um, and so, and like I said, there are other people who have been contacting me and getting ready to um, look at uh, different parts of uh, the King James Bible, uh, the 1611. Uh, listen, gang, uh, if you're interested in doing any of this work, what you should really do is uh, pick a chapter, uh, pick one of the books and, and just go to work. Uh, look for any of the, you know, signposts, the, the Baconian uh, cipher signatures, 6733. And, and 100 and, and so on. Um, and, and just start looking at those things and, and see what pops up. Uh, you, you'll be astounded. And the more you do it, uh, the easier it gets and the more you learn. Um, so, oh, Jan, I see a request. Thanks, Soltron. I appreciate your, your support. Um, some more paintings for us to pick apart, please. <laughs> oh, Jan, do I have some fun stuff in store for you? You're gonna love it. Um, yeah, we, I have a uh, a handful of uh, portraits and maybe a map or two that I'm gonna share over the course of the summer that I think you're really gonna love. Um, 
Yeah, Gitalis. I'm going to put that up on the screen too. Um, a lot of people don't know that about the actor William Shakespeare, that he, he was a bit of a, a, a con man as well as an actor. He was always trying to uh, make a fast buck. And, um, you know, when, by the time he became famous for his, his plays, so to speak, uh, people were laughing at him behind his back because they knew that he didn't write them. Uh, it, it was, you know, pretty commonly known that they were being written by someone using him as a mask. And uh, in fact, amongst uh, the inner circle, uh, it was quite um, a running joke for sure. So, all right, gang, uh, wrapping this up. Uh, thanks for joining me. I, like I said, a uh, beautiful weekend out there uh, today here in Northern New York and uh, this whole weekend. So we're going to enjoy our Memorial Day weekend here in the States. Um, wishing all of you a um, happy weekend. And uh, till next time, uh, just be cool to each other. And appreciate you very much. Uh, take care, gang. Uh, signing off now.